company. Uh, this is um, another event in a long series of events in a, in a project that we have called the 21st Century Border Initiative, which we started four years ago. Uh, we kicked off this series with, at a, with an event with uh, Alan Burson and Arturo Sarakan uh, back in the spring of 2010. And I just want to thank the Ford Foundation, who've been the major funder of this project from its uh, inception, and hopefully they're going to re-up this year, <laughs> um, uh, too. Uh, but our role, you know, this is the issues around U.S. and Mexico. There are a lot of people in town who've been doing remarkable work on this for a very long time, and we're kind of some of the new kids on the block. And part of what we uh, really wanted to try to do is to, you know, not do what others were doing, but to try to add a little bit of value uh, and really focus about how this debate was playing also inside the U United States. I mean, not just the in the traditional way that many of the organizations like Brookings, who's here today, and, and others looked at it, but how this was relevant to domestic U.S. politics. The basic idea being that with 10% of our population now in the United States being of Mexican descent, that the issues of U.S.-Mexico and how we treated our neighbors to the south was going to become an important domestic issue, the way that, the way that we looked at you know, how our foreign policy towards Israel matters as a domestic issue, the way that our policies in the old days towards Ireland, for example, mattered to many constituencies in the United States, that over time, as our population became more Latin, that the issues of this relationship domestically in U.S. politics was going to become more important. And if you got a chance to look at the, Ron, the piece that Ron Brownstein wrote last Friday, you know, in many ways, Ron, to me, is maybe the smartest political journalist writing in, in America today. Extensively. <laughs> And in fact, it's in fact it's probably it's probably on your chairs. In fact, um, my last point. Thank you for that, Nelson. Nelson's a good friend. You can tell. We've known each other for too long. I think Nelson um, is that uh, he points out that right now the issue of Mexico and how America is dealing with Mexico is central to two of the most important debates happening in, in domestic U.S. politics today: immigration reform, clearly but also the TPA, TPP, TTIP discussion as the opponents of, of TPP and TTIP have labeled the TPP as a, sorry for all these Washington acronyms, but TPP at the Trans-Pacific Partnership as NAFTA on steroids, right? So the issue of what happened with NAFTA and what it means for U.S. trade policy is now, you know, very present in, in, our, in our domestic debate. So we are very lucky today to have three of the leading lights uh, who've been helping guide this conversation uh, in Washington and around the U.S. And, and also in Mexico for a very long time. So enjoy. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I want to turn it over to my uh, dear friend, as you've already gotten to see, our close personal relationship, uh, my friend Nelson Cunningham. Simon, thank you very much. I think they gave me the one that has the cord so they can yank me off <laughs> to the side if I, if I get out of line. Uh, I am Nelson Cunningham. I am really pleased to be here moderating this session. I've been associated with NDN for uh, 12 or 14 years at this stage. And the reason I continue my association is really because there's nobody smarter than Simon Rosenberg at looking around the corner on political issues. He was talking about the blogosphere back before anybody else was. In 2004, he was identifying the Hispanic vote and the immigration issue as key issues uh, in our political future. Uh, on, he has continued to bang the drum on U.S.-Mexico, on, on border issues between the countries. Uh, he has been absolutely at the forefront of some of the most complicated and interesting political and policy issues. In fact, he's been ahead of the forefront on many of these issues, and the rest of us just catch up. So Simon, thanks for your leadership there, and thanks for creating NDN to create a platform for these sorts of discussions. Um, our topic today is U.S.-Mexico, and we're very lucky to have, uh, as Simon said, two of the leading lights here in this space. To my right, is Dr. Shannon O'Neill. Shannon is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. She uh, is a noted expert and author uh, on Mexico and on Latin America. In fact, uh, my brother-in-law and sister are here, and he has a copy of your book he would like you to yeah. autograph <laughs> for him. Happy 
me too. I, I told him I thought that you wouldn't mind. Exactly. Only if you hold it up right now. Yeah. 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 And the title is Two Nations Individual, which is frankly also a would be a good subtitle indivisible. for the, the indivisible, for <laughs> which would be a good title for, for this session. Um, Shannon has uh, two degrees from Yale and one from Harvard, which seems to be about even. <laughs> uh, at the far side, we have Eric Farnsworth. Uh, Eric was a uh, uh, career State Department official. Uh, I first knew him in the Clinton White House when he was instrumental in Mac McClarty's efforts and President Clinton's efforts to put together the summits of the Americas, the first one in Miami and then the next one in Santiago, Chile. And uh, I had the privilege of working with McClarty and with Farnsworth there. And I can say that I, I've relied on Eric uh, for the last 15 years to help me understand political and policy issues in Washington. He has, for the last decade, been heading the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas, which is the leading uh, business group focused on better relations between the United States and our neighbors. Um, we're going we're gonna to run this as a conversation rather than having sort of set speeches. Uh, we've got a little less than an hour, so I thought for the first period of time, I'll lead the conversation here with Shannon and with Eric, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for your questions, and I hope they're provocative and difficult and harder than mine. <laughs> um, let me start with the, the obvious place to start, which is uh, our president's and the Prime Minister of Canada met last week in Toluca, Mexico. This is, these periodic North American summits have been going on for some 10 or 12 years now. It really started under uh, George W. Bush and has, uh, and has continued on in the Obama administration. Uh, I think the next meeting will be in Canada. But this was Mexico's year to host and President Peña Nieto took the visiting leaders to his hometown of Toluca, Mexico, to try to talk about the economic development, to showcase some of his, uh, some of the reforms that he has put through. Let me start with Shannon and then Eric. Uh, what did they accomplish last week? Well, thank you, Nelson, and thank you, Simon, for, for hosting us here. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, this was an important meeting, but if we need to turn you on. Is it on? Here we go. So this meeting, I would say, is like a lot of U.S.-Mexico relations. Uh, it was an important meeting, but it was an urgent meeting. Because many of many things are going well in the relationship, and many of barriers are not ones that are urgent, that have to be solved tomorrow. Um, but if they're not solved over the next several years, it will be detrimental to both countries. So many of these issues were actually on the table. And the main focus, as you mentioned, were the economic ties. And so how do the two nations, or three nations, build on the basis that we have? Much of it establishing NAFTA has been in shadow. How do they build on that and really benefit from that? So what are the things that can facilitate trade over the borders? How can we support the companies that now do joint production, so things are made throughout the region, throughout North America? How do we also do this in light of the security issues and all that? So a lot of the things that came out of the meeting were things like, let's create, rather than two trusted travel programs that operate separately, autonomously, on the two different borders, how can we make that a trilateral arrangement? Other things that came out is that we but will commit a For those of us who travel frequently in North America, yes. that's not inconsiderable. It is not, yeah. right? Exactly. How do we speed the flows over the borders in terms of the paper processing, in terms of the customs, in terms of all the different types of bureaucracy that you have to go through? And also, how do we put on the table things like regulations? I mean, this is not fun. This is not big press releases. This is not something that makes journalists get all excited. But it really matters. If you're trying to make a car or a jet or anything else, Across the borders, it matters if the regulations say on this piece in Mexico the, the labels have to be three inches, and in the United States the labels have to be four inches because you have to create a whole different product. So some of this stuff is really nitty gritty is what was on the table and what the president's committed to to take on in this process. Uh, 
Eric, what did they what did they accomplish last week, and was it worth it? Well, thanks, Nelson. You know, it's it's tough to bat fourth or clean up after three of really the smartest uh, folks on these issues. So Simon and Nelson, I have worked with Nelson for uh, a long time. I've appreciated his leadership on these issues as I've appreciated Simon's as well. And Shannon has just done a terrific job explaining uh, the relationship with Mexico and North America indeed to a broader audience. And I, I mean that sincerely. I mean, for those of us who exist in this space, nonetheless, Shannon is somebody that we uh, refer to quite frequently to, to actually educate ourselves before we do things like talk to broader groups. So it's, it's really a privilege to be here. I, you know, I, th I think that the meeting was an important one. I, uh, as Nelson uh, indicated, I cut my teeth at the State Department in uh, summits and, uh, and bilateral, trilateral, multilateral meetings. I think there's value in simply meeting together. I, I think there's a critical symbolic statement that is made when leaders get together and form an agenda that a bureaucracy has to go through, uh, not just the motions of developing, but then once it's there, has to then move toward implementation. This is a valuable exercise, because look at it. For a global power like the United States, we have uh, very serious commitments, obviously, in the Middle East, obviously in Europe, obviously in Asia. And unless there are action-forcing events, oftentimes topics that are important but not urgent, I think, Shannon, that's how you put it, just don't get the type of attention they need. And what are some of those action forcing events? Well, goodness knows we don't need wars or economic meltdowns, but we do need sometimes presidential level and prime ministerial level meetings that can drive an agenda. So from that perspective, Nelson, I think it was a very important meeting. And I'm glad to see that uh, a, um, a summit um, uh, process, if you will, that was begun several years ago has continued. Um, now, I think the question is a logical one that follows, okay, they met together, was it worth the president's time to have met? Uh, or did it have to happen now? Could it have happened six months from now or six months ago? And I think that those are, those are legitimate questions. But I would, I would uh, simply agree with what Shannon said. You know, the U.S. relationship with Mexico and indeed the U.S. relationship with Canada have evolved to the point that we are virtually linked and, and, and not just virtually, but frankly, uh, linked directly, economically, to our closest trading partners. And sometimes what makes a relationship go is not big, grand, visionary, world-changing strategies, which may not even be practicable, but it's actually how do you get across the border efficiently? How do you get your products across the border efficiently? How can you find ways to cooperate on energy in a, in a sector that is undergoing right now revolutionary change in North America. And how can you build a framework around that so that as these activities are done in a way that make economic sense, they're also done in a way that make environmental sense and make sense for the people of the region. And so I think from that perspective, Nelson, uh, you know, we could go into the, what they call deliverables, et cetera, and some of the specifics. But I do think uh, there is value to meeting. I think that some of the specifics that came out were valuable. And I think then the final thing I would say on that point is, is we have to then have implementation. That's a key for any meeting. Sometimes implementation lags um, just because that's the way of the world. So you have to have some follow-up. And uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about that uh, going forward as well. Yeah, yeah good. Now, it, it has been mentioned. Uh, this meeting, which occurred last week, took place on roughly the 20th anniversary of the implementation of the NAFTA Accord, which, of course, was negotiated by President H.W. Bush, was uh, then inherited by Bill Clinton, who actually ran sort of against it. Uh, but then once he became president, uh, he, uh, he added side letters and then pushed hard through the Congress to get it passed in 1993 and then it came into Im effect in 1994. So the, the three leaders met on the 20th anniversary of NAFTA uh, in Mexico, and I, I read our president's words there very carefully, and he spoke, he had an opening statement, and there were question and answer. In his opening statement, he talked about North American competitiveness, he talked about linking the economies, he talked about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is now being negotiated. He did not use the word NAFTA. Now, there was a question placed by a journalist about, to the three presidents, the three leaders, about the 20th anniversary of NAFTA. Uh, you know, Mr. President, what do you have to say about <coughs> this? And 
President Obama, in his response, again talked about North American competitiveness, talked about the ways the economies have been linked, and once again, did not use the word NAFTA. Uh, Eric, let me start with you. What does that tell us, and we'll get into this a little more deeply, what does that tell us about some of the political issues surrounding NAFTA today, if anything? Well, I think it's, it tells us very clearly that some of the issues remain unsettled. Uh, but I think, you know, it also tells us that the world has changed in 20 years. You know, NAFTA's been around for 20 years. It was, it was revolutionary when it was passed. But let's do a thought experiment for a little bit. 20 years ago, think about where all of us were. Facebook just celebrated its 10th anniversary. <laughs> NAFTA has ex existed 10 years longer than Facebook. Now, Facebook, has that changed North America? No, but think about what that represents in the context of technological change. Think about the energy sector. Does anybody, did anybody five years ago even know what fracking was? We probably would have had our mouths washed out with soap if we said <laughs> fracking. Right? But it has fundamentally changed North American energy and, in fact, global energy. Look at the auto sector. The changes, think about the cars that we were driving 20 years ago, Nelson, and the cars that we're driving today. Well, in my case, I work in the nonprofit world, so the car's actually about the same. <laughs> but for those of you who actually, you know, have progressed in your careers, et cetera, you're driving a car that just, it almost literally, literally drives itself. Now, I ask you, does a, an economic framework that was created before these things actually even occurred, is that a framework that continues to be something that the president should say, okay, we need to go and celebrate this specific document. In my view, the world has moved on in a very positive way, in a way that was both encouraged by and supported by NAFTA. NAFTA framed the economic relationship, and then what happened was the three countries in the NAFTA relationship, and let's not forget Canada. The three countries in the North American relationship took that framework and built to an amazing place where we are today. Does that mean everything's perfect? No, that's not what it means but it does mean that we are in a fundamentally different place. And I think what it says, Nelson, is that you know, the leaders recognize the politics around the issue. There's no, no doubt about that. But I think they also recognize that the world has moved on and collectively we need to uh, begin to discuss what is the next phase of the relationship. The truth of the matter is I, I think the Obama administration has actually paid quite a lot of uh, positive attention to Mexico recently. The vice president has been there. The high-level economic dialogue has been launched, which I think is a very positive uh, way to try to build the bilateral agenda. We had the president's visit, of course. This was, and this was President Obama's fifth visit That's to Mexico. Correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, the Secretary of Commerce just made her first foreign visit, was to Mexico in January. This is clearly a priority for the administration. I think that that, that matters. And the other thing I would say, and this is really Shannon's territory, so maybe I, I lead you up to it. Um, oh, we can talk about the economic relationship has changed, and I want to get into that a little bit more in terms of how that's changed a little bit later, but Mexico has changed. Think about what Mexico was as a country in 1994 and where it is today. We've had two uh, governments from the previous opposition and now a return to the PRI, democracy is the two. You have a country with a growing middle class. I mean, we're talking about things like 30-year mortgages in Mexico. We weren't talking about 30-year mortgages in 1994. We're talking about high-tech production in Carretero, aerospace. Who knows that Mexico has a thriving aerospace sector? I mean, this is reality. This is where the country is. We're talking about high-tech production in the medical devices sector, in energy. We could go on and on. My point is that many of the impressions, and I think, Nelson, this is the point that I'm, I'm getting around to in a, in a circular way, to be sure, but I'm getting there. <laughs> many of the pr impressions that people have about the word NAFTA were formed in 1994, mm -hmm. and they haven't been updated. They haven't come to where we are now with a partner south of us that is a true partner now, an economic partner, where trade has quadrupled, quadrupled in 20 years. This is a different world we're living in. And we can't use the same talking points either for or against NAFTA. And I think we're trying to figure out what is the nomenclature, what are those words, how do we talk about North America in an effective way in the 20th anniversary of NAFTA? Uh, Shannon, another N-word that's even older mm -hmm. than NAFTA is NATO. And the reasons why NATO was created are long gone. The, the geopolitical realities have changed, and yet NATO remains a vital framework and is on the lips of presidents, leaders, is an active part of the policy discussion. Uh, have we walked away from NAFTA? Could the president have used his visit last week to celebrate 
NAFTA and some of the benefits of the last 20 years, or at least have a good, a strong discussion about it, mm -hmm. or was an opportunity missed? You know, I think it's an opportunity missed because I actually think we have not had a real full discussion of NAFTA. There are people who talk about NAFTA out there, but I don't think this is a broad, inclusive group. We're not having that discussion here. And you know, if you look at any serious economic study of what NAFTA has, what has happened with NAFTA, there are widespread benefits uh, and there are co very concentrated losses. And the benefits outweigh the losses. Everybody has that. Um, the challenge, I think, actually, in talking about NAFTA is when we think about the counterfactual, what the world would have been like without NAFTA, I don't think we actually think about what that would be. What would the US be today if we had never signed NAFTA? Would we still see apparel made in Lowell, Massachusetts, carpets in the Carolinas, drill bits in Cleveland, Ohio? Would those things still be happening if we had NAFTA? And the answer is no. Because all of those things today are made in China, with whom we do not have a free trade agreement. It has nothing to do with NAFTA. Now, if we had not signed NAFTA, do you think we would see cars made in Detroit? Would we see airplanes and jets made in Kansas City? Would we see tractors made in Peoria, Illinois? And the answer is probably no. We would not see those made there. And what we're not capturing in a lot of our NAFTA discussions is that it has helped maintain jobs in many of these advanced manufacturing sectors and then also created them. And so that dynamic just gets lost in these conversations. And so are there concentrated losses in NAFTA? Yes, there are, right? And they particularly fall on the less educated, the lower skilled workers. But have there been big benefits, and particularly given globalization, given the way the world has gone, many of the things that Eric talked about, has it helped us remain competitive globally? So we, too, have regional supply chains that allow us to keep, compete with China and Asia and other places. I mean, that is fundamentally what NAFTA has done. Well, let me, let me build on that, because, and then it will take us to, uh, eventually, to the economic reforms that have been pushed through in Mexico in the last year. But talk to us about the way that NAFTA has changed Mexico and has changed the relationship of the U.S. with Mexico over the last mm -hmm. 20 years. And one of the most fascinating, I think, overlooked in our, in our country here is how much Mexico has changed. And you look at Mexico pre-NAFTA, and this was a closed economy. Well, it was based on commodities and agricultural, primarily. Today, it is one of the most open commercially. So its openness, its trade to GDP globally is higher than the United States, higher than Brazil, higher even than China, rivaling China. Uh, it has globally competitive industries, many because they're linked to production in the United States. So because we make cars together and planes together and flat screen TVs and all sorts of appliances and everything, because of that, it has become very competitive in particular industries. Uh, so Mexico itself has changed. It has moved from an agriculture and commodity-based economy to one based on manufacturing and services. It has modernized significantly. The changes that we saw this last year, which we can talk about the reforms, while it opened commercially, it had not yet really opened domestically, so the structures of the domestic economy. And that is what many of the reforms of the last year are doing, trying to open up the domestic economy to greater competition and productivity and, and efficiency and all the like. I mean, the other big change that happened in this 20 years, and it's not because of NAFTA, but NAFTA helped this occur, is Mexico opened up democratically. I mean, it was already in the process, but it has now become a vibrant, if at times messy, democracy, much like our own in that sense. And that, you know, we have neighbors now where we have similar political systems, we have similar open to the world global economic systems. We have increasingly similar social systems too, because Mexico's in this process, We've seen the growth of a middle class. Could it have been faster? Could it have been broader? Could it be more inclusive? Of course, that's what we all want. But that, too, is happening in Mexico. And it's good for Mexico in terms of its politics, in terms of the people that are now coming into this middle class. It's also good for the United States, because we increasingly sell to these people. And Mexicans of almost any country like US goods. Uh, Eric, some have pointed out that NAFTA has a political dimension as well as an economic dimension. Uh, what would you say is the impact of NAFTA on the US-Mexico relationship? And you and I remember mm -hmm. yeah. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when we were in the Clinton White House, uh, how difficult the relationship could be sometimes. How is it today? 
You know, that's a really important question and oftentimes overlooked. Um, and from my perspective, it's what, what NAFTA has done is it, is it created uh, the bumpers on the pool table, right? It doesn't mean that those pool balls aren't going to knock into each other and go all over different places. We've all got domestic politics. We've got our different, you know, uh, things going on on each side of the border. But the balls stay on the table. They stay within bounds. And what I mean by that is, and, and Nelson, you referred obliquely to, um, you know, things going on. Let me be explicit. Right after NAFTA was passed, Mexico tried to devalue its peso. It bungled the devaluation. It caused a significant crisis, uh, not just in Mexico, but throughout uh, Latin America and other emerging markets. Um, NAFTA was in place. Had NAFTA not been in place, Mexico presumably, we don't know the counter negatives, but Mexico presumably would have reacted in the same way it reacted to the debt crisis of 1980, which is to say close itself off economically, go protectionist, and do all kinds of things that an economist would say is probably not the right way to go. Instead, because of NAFTA, Mexico was required to keep its markets open. It was required to stay uh, connected to the United States, and that caused it to remain open to the global financial community. Uh, there was a rescue package uh, tied to oil, et cetera. Uh, but the upshot of that is that Mexico returned to capital markets nine months after the peso crisis, as opposed to nine years after the debt crisis in the 1980s. Now, fast forward to today. There are things that occur in the United States that NAFTA had prevented us from making work. For example, think about the debt crisis, sorry, not the debt crisis, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. At that point, there was a very active uh, movement to try to uh, restrict government purchases of products only made in the United States. According to NAFTA, we weren't able to do that, and we were required to keep our borders open at least to products from Canada and Mexico. And the fact is, that was good for the United States, in my view. Very good, because, and I want to build on what Chairman was saying in terms of the production model. According to the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is nonpartisan, it's not affiliated with any party, it's very technical, very economic, um, 40% of every dollar that's spent to the United States from Mexico is produced in the United States. It's 40% it's of Mexican exports to the U.S. is local content from the United States. So that means that, just as Shannon said, when those products are produced in Mexico, when those jobs are produced in Mexico, it's actually creating jobs in the United States because it takes U.S. production to get Mexican production to send back to the United States or indeed to the rest of the world. Canada is a similar story. It's not as dramatic, but it's 25% of Canadian exports to the U.S. represent U.S. Uh, initial products. Now, let's compare that to what's happened in other countries in the world. China is obviously the country that everybody focuses on first, and with good measure, it's 4% of U.S. local content. So 10 times more local content from Mexico than from China comes into the United States in terms of the dollar of export. Why is that important? It's important because as people are looking to source products from overseas, right, that competitiveness of Mexico becomes very important, not just for Mexico, but also for the United States and for the United States workers. And that's really important. And because of NAFTA, Nelson, in my view, we're not able to take steps that might be politically um, interesting in the moment, but might have a longer term uh, detrimental impact. I think that's really important. And then I, 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 within this context, I want to take advantage of, of kind of discussing the production model to very quickly talk about how it's even going to improve further. Uh, with energy reform in Mexico. And the reason why is because when, when we talk about energy reform in Mexico, everybody thinks about investment in the oil and gas sector. And that's, that's the headline. Uh, that's an important aspect of it. But what's really going to be the impact, from my perspective, is not so much oil and gas. It's power generation. It's electricity. Why is that? Because every manufacturer requires electricity. And the cost of electricity in Mexico right now is really high. So that means that every manufacturer, every consumer who's using electricity, and that means everybody in Mexico, is paying a very high cost for power to do basic production. Now, let's fast forward. Assuming these, these uh, regulations are put in place by April 30th, the end of the legislative session, in a way that actually opens the market in a way that many of us hope that it does, the cost of electricity goes down immediately. The competitiveness, the productivity of manufacturing broadly goes up. Right? So, if you go back to what I just said in terms of 40% of U.S. input and the competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing goes up, what does that say about the United States? More manufacturing from Mexico, more jobs in the United States. Now, this is not theory. This is happening. 
This is the way the production model works in North America. And so what we've seen is a co-production model that's literally benefiting all three of the economies of North America. Really exciting stuff. The final point in terms of, of energy that I would say, it's not just on the production side, it's also in terms of the consu consumption side. All of us use electricity. I got three kids, they're on the computers all the time. I just saw my electricity, my power bill. It's too high, right? Not because the electricity rates are too high, we can argue that, but because we use too much of it, right? Okay, fair enough. If the cost of electricity to the consumer in Mexico goes down, what do consumers have more of? Disposable income. What is that disposable income gonna go toward? Purchasing its products. It's growing middle class, it's growing disposable income. It's exactly that happy circle that we all talk about in terms of saying that we want, this is happening. Is it the only thing? No, there's lots more going on. But in the context, Nelson, of, of your question, I, I, would, I would really link it to the change in the production model which was facilitated originally by NASA. Um, Eric, let, let's stick right now with the topic of the reforms in Mexico over the last sure. year. You yeah. touched on the energy reforms. And after this round of questions, I'm gonna open it up to the audience, so please be thinking about uh, how you'd like to challenge us up here. Uh, Shannon, at the beginning of the Peña Nieto administration, mm -hmm. uh, we saw something remarkable happen. It's particularly remarkable when you think about it here from the Washington perspective, where we can't even agree on anything. Uh, but the three very different political parties in Mexico got together and agreed to the Pacto, a set of fundamental reforms, political, economic, labor reforms, uh, which all three parties agreed were necessary for Mexico's future. And during the first year of the Peña Nieto administration this past year, every single one of them was pushed through. Now, some weren't pushed through in quite the way that some might have wished or they might have been changed a bit along the way, but they were all pushed through. Now we're in the second year and we're passing the secondary legislation. Mm -hmm. the, the first year they sort of set the broad, the broad blueprints, now the Congress is working on the details. Um, those who sort of view Mexico with a certain amount of skepticism are looking at these next set of, the second set of uh, legislation with some skepticism. Uh, what's your view of what's gonna happen this year? Are we gonna carry forward with those reforms or will we see some of the uh, inertia forces in Mexico stop, slow down, or even reverse some mm -hmm. of those reforms? Well, as you said, last year was, was a big year. And so this government passed 16 reforms in 16 months, which is impressive by any standard, particularly when we sit here in Washington, is sort of mind boggling. Um, but what happens now? That's a big question. And, and here I think you can say glass half empty, glass half full. Um, the glass half full side is actually in some of the constitutional reforms, the big reforms they did last year. Rather than just saying, we're gonna open up the energy sector and you guys figure out the details later, they actually put in several, um, what are called transitory uh, elements. So some of the, the the blueprint is more developed than, than one might think, right? It's not just let's open up the sector, but we're opening up the sector and here's the four or five different types of licenses or types of, of investments that will be allowed. So some of the details of the pact went to that level to really set up uh, the opening in a way that is harder to backtrack on um, for you know, special interest reasons or populist reasons or whatever other reasons that might lead you to backtrack. Um, so that would say the glass half full is that these reforms were not just a reform, but, but a pretty detailed reform in some ways that are now in the Constitution are very, very hard to change. Um, but uh, as we know in our own country, but also in Mexico, uh, Mexico has a long history of writing quite elegant and beautiful laws, um, which hold you know, a slight resemblance to reality. Um, so how do you get the laws that are written very well and technically very astute, and, and how do you get that to become the de facto, the de jure to become the de facto reality on the ground. And that is, I th do think that will be the big challenge for Mexico. One is what do the next set of reforms look like? What is in the, the sort of legislation that, that lays it out? What will they really allow? And will they be able to keep pushing forward to open up sectors? For instance, in telecommunications and other, where the law is to open up the sector to increase competition, will they be able to do that when you know, one of the players that would like them not to open up the sector is either the wealthiest man in the world. Um, so th that's a challenge. One is what's in the legislation. The other thing that I will be watching over this year and going forward is so much of the effectiveness of this reform 
will depend on newly created or uh, increasingly expanded the independence of regulators, of regulatory bodies. And so one challenge I think Mexico faces is that you need to find a whole group of very talented, um, very te technical expertise um, that's quite independent and autonomous for a whole host of industries all at the same time, uh, while you also are empowering them to do their job to take on some of the biggest fish in Mexico's economy. And so, you know, just to name energy to start with, you need to find people who know the energy sector very well and then who can who can obviously technically regulate it. Um, but when you look at Mexico's history, who knows the energy sector very well? Well, people have worked at Pemex for many, many years. They're the ones who know the sector well. But can you find people who have worked in Pemex who then can be independent and be open to and want to push a much more open competitive sector? I mean, that, that's the challenge, right? Can you find the autonomous people but also have the expertise? Now, the good thing is in Mexico, it's a large country with um, you know, many differences between classes and education, but there's, there's a deep bench of very talented people in Mexico. So there are people to pull from, but I do think this is, when we look forward, we look 10 years from now, and did these reforms make the difference? We've, we've seen Mexico open commercially, but it does it open domestically in its economy. This role of the regulators in so many sectors will actually, I think, be one of these turning points, one of the crucial factors. Uh, Eric, you and the Council of the Americas consult with business, represent business, What's the business, the, the U.S. business perspective on the reforms and in particular on this, set, this next, the secondary implementing legislation and whether it's meeting the promise? In terms of energy or just more broadly? More broadly. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the first thing that I hear constantly, and I heard it again just this morning with some, from some folks, is these are Mexico's reforms to make. <laughs> Mexico is a sovereign country. It's their process. We have interests, but... We're not going to do anything that uh, would in any way, directly or indirectly, suggest that the United States is gonna meddle, et cetera. And I think that's the right place to be, to be perfectly honest. This is a Mexican process, deeply Mexican process, uh, which is good. Now, having said that, uh, obviously, people are watching things very carefully. Uh, and um, I, it's hard to project in terms of how things will come out, and I think Shannon, um, has quite accurately suggested that the, the pace of reform in Mexico has been, you know, mind-numbing in some ways, uh, not just for Mexico, but for political processes anywhere, and look at what has to, remains to be done in a very, very short period of time, because the legislative session, as I alluded to earlier, ends on April 30th. That's only two months from now, and yet you have to have this implementing legislation go through for many of these reforms, not just energy, each one of which presumably would take a lot more than two months to, to do it if you had more than two months. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a time issue here. There's an issue of very senior officials involved in many of these uh, just 24 hours in a day. And so um, I think there's a certain risk uh, that indeed uh, because of the speed that's necessary, you won't optimize every reform in a way that uh, every observer might uh, want it to be done. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I can't, I, I don't think we can minimize what's happened and frankly where we're going to get. And this is the next logical step in Mexico's uh, efforts to become um, really a, a developed economy. And I think is taking the steps necessary. And you know, like we know here in our country, legislation at some point down the road, you know, if the regulation doesn't quite do what it's supposed to do, you know, the next legislative session can address some of these things. So. Um, it's a very tight timeline. I think that's, that's an issue, but by and large, I think people are pretty optimistic. Uh, there are many topics that we haven't yet touched, immigration, security, narcotics, other issues, but let's turn to the audience and see what's on your mind. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Do we, we, have, a mic we have microphones for you? Uh, tell us who you are and, uh, and then ask your question. Yes. Hi, I'm Jane Terry from the Organization of American States. I have two separate questions. One is um, in the name of Bob Pastor, I'm wondering about getting beyond NAFTA to our North American community and bringing in all of those topics that Nelson mentioned. And second, is there, are there innovative state to state along the border, new things that are coming up that can kind of bypass our local gridlock? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, let me just touch on, on uh, your first comment in that 
actually at the council right now, we are in the midst of a task force on North America, and, and Bob was a member of it until his, his recent passing. And so uh, uh, in his great respect for what he's done, I do think we're starting to think about that. And in fact, in some ways, the fact that the comments down, or the, the speeches that were given down in, in Toluca focused on this future, on the competitiveness, on the way we work together is a recognition by the three presidents that, that North America is the way forward. And, and we do have significant tailwinds. I think the energy revolution is, is, is a push for North America because all countries have it, and, and the bringing together of grids, of pipelines and things give us both uh, the lower energy costs that Eric was talking about, and also resilience in our system, which, it, which is quite important. So I do think there are, uh, there is beginning to be this focus on North America, though uh, not as, as fast and as deep as I know Bob uh, had always wished. What was the second one, Jane? I'm sorry. State to state. Oh, state to state. Yeah, actually, the answer is yes. You know, what, we've done a lot of work on the border, actually. This gives me an opportunity to advertise, so thank you. Um, the council has had a border and competitiveness initiative for, for a couple of years now that uh, actually was uh, first identified to us by our chairman, uh, Ambassador John Negroponte, as something we should be focused on, uh, and he's quite right. And um, the reason why is because despite all the happy talk we've been having here about econ economic connection and people to people and NAFTA and all this stuff, the fact of the matter is products and people still have to cross a border, and the more complicated that is on a daily basis, the more difficult it is, the more sand in the gears it is for the economic relationship. And the reason why I'm going into that is because at the border, there are almost innumerable number of entities who have some say over border politics. I mean, we think about Washington and Mexico City, but you have state governments on both sides, you have local governments on both sides, you have numerous federal agencies, uh, not just the law enforcement agencies, but the environmental side, the commerce side, the diplomatic side, you name it energy side, so I mean there is a multitude of interested actors here and it becomes really complicated just as a practical matter to get a border crossing or a staffing issue or something. And so the reason why I'm going into that is because that in some ways explains some of the stasis about new infrastructure that everybody says we need but we can't quite figure out how to, how to finance it or how to get it there. But one thing that is, is particularly interesting uh, from my perspective is that some of the local communities have said, okay, enough. Things are changing, we need to change them faster. The increased pressure from Mexico in terms of greater competitiveness and the need to get stuff to the United States and vice versa means that there's gonna be even more pressure on the border unless we act. And you're starting to have communities actually work in tandem as spaces. Instead of Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, you're having communities work together on both sides of the border, or San Diego, Tijuana, or El Paso Juarez. And in fact, uh, Emma was with us in El Paso and we did a big event there. Um, last summer, and by the way, it was in August, so all of you who think that we go on junkets, uh, <laughs> absolutely wrong, August in El Paso is uh, pretty unforgiving. But it, was, uh, but it was good because you had congressmen, you have congressmen like Beto O'Rourke, uh, who are trying to organize communities to say, look, this is an issue that might affect somebody else too, but we can have a local solution to this. We can work with federal agencies to get different staffing times, different agencies to do various things and have local solutions. And, and that's one of the things that I think is cutting through, if you will, the, uh, the stasis. You're, you're having people stand up and say, it doesn't have to be the same solution from San Diego to Laredo. It can be, which is 1,800 miles. I mean, you wouldn't think about the same solution basically anywhere else. I mean, there has to be room for local solutions and I think that's, that's what people are coming to, to see within you know, the federal mandates, et cetera. But I, I think that's a, a very interesting aspect of what's happening. We'll turn to uh, the young lady in the front row. Diana Negroponte at the Brookings Institution. First of all, I want to congratulate Eric on the latest edition of America's Quarterly, uh, 20 Years of NAFTA, which is a superb edition. And Sharon, I loved your book, Two Nations <laughs> Indivisible, <laughs> including the anecdotes that are very personal to you. So thank you for the publication of your book. My question challenges the concept of the trilateral NAFTA. It's stale. And instead, there has emerged two bilaterals. US-Mexico, US-Canada. And for all our Canadian friends in this room, you were the least enthusiastic <laughs> about going to Toluca last week. <laughs> but Prime Minister did go two days earlier to carry out Canadian-Mexican business of which there are some serious problems, particularly with regard to visas. 
So what I'm going to suggest is that NAFTA's there, so was EFTA. Any of you remember the free trade of the Europeans? It's there, but so what? So what we need to do is build on that North American platform, which enables these two bilaterals to continue on at the same time, and means that US-Canadian issues over Keystone or Canadian-Mexican issues over visas don't capture, trap, the rest of the issues that we have to move on forward. Do I make sense in focusing on two bilaterals rather than one trilateral? You know, this is in many ways the challenge, right? NAFTA was the trilateral agreement, which you know the Canadians got sort of you know, un unhappily pulled into or perhaps reluctantly pulled into at the time. And then there, there was a lot of trilateralism, you could say, in the 90s. And then especially after 9-11 with the changes on the border and the way we, the vulnerability in the United States felt and the way we responded to that, it became a dual bilateral track. And for many, many years, security trumped economic issues. Now I think we're trying to rebalance the economic with the, the security needs. But it's been on these two tracks. And there are reasons to have two tracks. Right? We have very different histories with the two countries. We have different issues, as you mentioned, where some pertain to one border and some pertain to the other border, or to the relations with the countries. But I do think if we throw out the idea of trilateralism, we lose some of the real efficiencies and benefits. And, and you know, the first one we mentioned was just this trusted traveler program. If you are an executive or a student or whoever you are and you like to travel to both countries, uh, and you uh, want to go you know, do global entry or do, or do some of the, the fast track, you have to apply twice. You have to do Century program in Mexico and then Nexus program up in Canada. And you have to go through the whole process. And that might be fine for Nelson who travels back and forth to these countries. But what about if you're shipping day in and day out tons and tons of products because this is the way your company works. And every time you have to go through the two separate programs, it's very costly. Um, particularly as we start doing things in all three countries with this joint production platform. Giving up the idea of trilateralism, I think, is, will be a cost. The other thing is we look forward to the future, and we talk about, you mentioned the uh, negotiations with the EU and a, and a trade agreement there, which we are going ahead unilaterally, the United States. We forget that many of the industries that we're negotiating about with the EU are not really US industries anymore. They're North American industries. So we might negotiate something with Europe about the car industry, about auto parts, about produce, about all sorts of regulations. And unless we're taking into account this deep interconnection that you know beef happens in three countries sometimes, cars definitely happen in three countries every time. If we start sending up regulations that don't take into account this reality, we will hurt our own producers of all of these things because they will have to change the way they produce things. And so here, I think there are spaces where it's very important, actually, to not throw out trilateralism. To, to Sometimes a du dual bilateralism will be good, but I actually think we should not forget or shy away from trilateralism, because while it might be easier in the short term, I think in the long term, it will create problems for us in terms of our global competitiveness. Uh, Eric, anything to add to that, or should we move to another topic? Uh, just very briefly, if I can, what's the old saying in politics? Some of my friends are on one side of the issue, and some of my friends are on the other side, and I'm with my friends. <laughs> um, I actually agree with, with both Diane and Shannon, and, and not to say you're disagreeing, but simply to say that... Um, both your uh, you're both my <laughs> friends. Thank you for, for owning that, um, not rejecting that. But, but uh, I think the way you characterized it is, is true in the context of how um, the governments largely work together. And I think at the same time, that was the uh, perhaps the greatest opportunity that may have been missed from Toluca, uh, which is to say that I think there's a huge amount that can be done from the North American perspective. Yes, there are always going to be those bilateral issues. Nobody minimizes those. But you know, for example, I'll go further in terms of negotiating with Europe. It's hard to do that if you're at the table by yourself and Mexico is not at the table with you and Canada is not at the table with you. All right? It's hard to negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership by yourself without Canada or Mexico. Uh, Canada and Mexico are now there, but they weren't at the beginning. And it's, it, why should this even be an argument at this point? I mean, the, the concept that we have to suggest, you know, we have to go through the same 
you know, uh, understanding of the, of the you know, production model at this point. It, 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 it's just not internalized at this point in the way that I think some people would hope it would be, particularly when your main competition is unified countries or unified regions, China certainly, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. We, we don't compete anymore by ourselves. Um, so I think that's a very important point. And I, I think that um, the one thing that I wish would have happened has nothing to do with the economic side, even on the trade side or anything like that. I think that there's a very meaningful voice, particularly in hemispheric affairs, for North America, for the three leaders of sovereign countries in North America to stand up on issues of the day within the, uh, within the Western Hemisphere, for example. I, would, I was hoping very much for a statement on Venezuela, for example, uh, from Toluca. Didn't happen. Now that's because maybe not all three leaders saw the issue in the same way. But my point is we're leaving progress on the table if we're not willing to go forward as a region in some ways and talk about some of these issues in a broader way. So I, I think that that is the next step. I think we can we work toward that together, but we're not there yet. Good. Uh, in the second row. Hi, I'm Gad from UPS. Um, I know you want to go to the west side of the room. We're dominating on the east side. so. Um, <laughs> We move a lot of stuff across the border every day, and so do our competitors. And you know, I would paint the opportunity gap as uh, I buy a plane at triple seven for two hundred sixty nine million dollars, and I fly to China every day with pain, plane loads back and forth. I buy a truck for two hundred thousand dollars to drive it between the United States and Mexico, but it's more competitive for me to use fuel in a two hundred sixty nine million dollar plane mm -hmm. and bring goods to the United States. So. You know, I don't know how you assembled the panel, but we're, there are no contrarians. Everybody thinks this is a good idea. Uh, how come it's not working? What's it going to take to spark the imagination? You know, there's a term at UPS I really hate at the time of the year when we get salaries. We're always constructively dissatisfied. <laughs> Everything could be better and better and better. And why in North America have we not figured out what it's going to take to be more competitive as a unit than handing our checks over to Asia. I mean, I think this was when we went back to, was this a missed opportunity to talk about NAFTA? I, I think it was. And in part, the story that we hear, the way we think about our neighbors is, you know, we tried something with them and it didn't work out so well. You know, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a benefit, but we don't quite see uh, wh what happened. Um, and you know, you get the trade numbers and, and they're quite impressive. I and mean, we went from $40 billion of trade, of, of U.S. exports to Mexico to $250 billion and, and the reverse as well. So there's a lot more going on. So it's not, it's not that you're not in, in North America, right, and, and going back and forth as UPS. Um, but this change in the way we make things, I, I really think that isn't out there in the popular imagination. And so it's hard then for elected officials if, if if people don't know what's going on, if people don't really get a sense of, of why it matters, and that this is in many ways a strong alternative to buying, to importing everything from, from China and places, I think then it's hard for the US and for our politicians who you know, have a hard time agreeing on about anything right now to, to come behind an issue. And um, you know, I was thinking about the, the numbers and, and these percentages that Eric threw out, which are, which are incredible. But if you break those down into numbers, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's more striking. You know, so we import every year, last year, about $280 billion from Mexico. And about $115 billion of that was actually made in the United States by US workers, over $100 billion of that. From China, we import, which you import most of it, right, is $425 billion. And about 15, 20 billion of that was made in the United States by US workers. It's nothing. Um, so the reality is there, but I think we haven't quite brought it into our policy discussions to say, hey, this is actually a really good thing for the United States. It makes us more competitive. It keeps, you know, especially advanced manufacturing here, which means the R&D happens here, the innovation, which leads into other sectors. I don't think we've really had this discussion yet. And the fact that energy is changing here, we, even more of this could be here. And you know, as you say, it's a, it's a lot harder to get it across the border. I mean, I, an anecdote, which is a sad anecdote, is when I, I lived in Mexico and I bought this furniture and I lived down there and I wanted to bring it back because I thought it was, it was cool. And so I went to check out my shipping options. I thought, I'll ship it. And they said, no, it's cheaper to fly it than to ship it across the border. So I flew my furniture, I mean, heavy furniture, because that was the cheapest way to get it here. And so the issues that were discussed at the summit, this fact of trying to make the border more streamlined, I think are vital. Um, and so 
yes, it was great that all the presidents agreed on it. Yes, it was great that we put some action points out there. But this implementation that Eric brought up, I mean, I think that's vital that we keep on it. And people, your company and others really push, OK, we do need these regulatory change. We do need more ports. We do need more you know, blue, unif or the, or blue uniforms at the border, not just green uniforms. right? We need the people at customs to make it so it doesn't cost you so much to get things across the border. Uh, we promised people we'd have them out at 1.15, so we've got about five more minutes. The gentleman here in the second row. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Rob Colarina, AIS Investment. Um, I was curious, have you seen trends with uh, overseas Mexicans coming back on the professional side and, and, and taking residents back and, and investing back in Mexico? Um, I'm Tomas Gonzalez. I, I work with GE Oil and Gas and also GE Energy. Uh, and we do send steel to Mexico to have it forged and then brought back to the U.S. The ingots are made in Pennsylvania. Uh, my question is, as the market opens up, how are we going to uh, deal with companies that don't necessarily play by the rules of FCPA coming into the Mexican economy? Let me, I'll, I'll start with the, with the Mexican immigrant question. And, you know, one thing we've seen over the last several years is, is a real decline in immigration. So decline in, in the back and forth. So now there's a net zero inflow from Mexico. Uh, in part that some people going back to Mexico, the job prospects here have been less. Some job prospects have been growing down there. Uh, in part as fewer people are leaving Mexico. And th there's a lot of reasons for that. One is demographic has changed there. So there's just fewer people turning 18 every year looking for a job. And so, you know, whether they look there or here, that's changed. In another, the economy there is opening up. There's more job opportunities, particularly at the higher skill level. So those who have more education have more opportunities there. I mean, one big change in Mexico, which we don't talk about all that much, but has which matters for our immigration in particular, uh, is education. And the number of years that the average Mexican student stays in school has doubled over the last 25 years. So today, the average 15-year-old is thinking about the tests they have on Friday, not are they going to move to the United States and where will they go to find a job. So I think we've seen shifts in immigration. Now that said, by the way, fifteen-year-olds yep. don't think about the test. <laughs> yeah. Having some children, I dare to dream that that's what they're thinking about. <laughs> uh, that said. Many of Mexico's most highly trained are here in the United States. So many of their college graduates, I saw one estimate almost half of their PhD holders actually live here in the United States. And we haven't talked about it here, but the uh, security issues over the last several years have also led many of Mexico's best and brightest or their families to move to the United States. Those who often can do move here. And so this is a challenge for Mexico. How do you keep your smartest, or how do you get, you know, what, what people talk, first they talk about brain drain, and then with India and China, they start to talk more and more about brain circulation. So people come here for a few years, or they get their PhDs, work for a bit, and they go back to their country and invest there. And I think that is, you see some of it in Mexico, but I don't think we see enough. And I think that is a challenge. How do you get more of their best to go back and, and make their home in Mexico, but also to really vitalize the economy there? Eric, you want to take the FCPA question and how that yeah, I'd, I'd tell you a though, if I, disadvantage? if I were a uh, foreign corrupt practices act, if I, were, if I had the answer to that, I would be making a lot of money right now uh, in the for-profit sector. It's a global phenomenon. It's not just a Mexico thing. It's not just a North American thing. Obviously, we know that. But, um, but we see it a lot across Latin America. Um, we see it a lot with new competitors uh, in the region uh, from non-traditional uh, countries, perhaps. Um, where you don't have the same, certainly, legislation as we have in the United States, but you don't even have the same cultural expectations of what it means to engage in business. It's a reality. Um, and I think the only way that one can address those topics, and I'd be, frankly, more than interested to hear any other ideas, because as I say, I don't have any answers, but, but it is, first of all, continuing forward, doing the right thing, knowing that that's what we should be doing. But second of all is naming and shaming when we're aware of violations of these types of activities. Um, because nobody particularly wants to be in the spotlight for allegations or certainly proven corruption activities. Um, and even from countries that um, it might 
previously it's been in their income tax code or whatever, you know, you deduct your payments abroad and things like that. <laughs> those companies, which exist, but those companies don't want to be in the public eye either, certainly not for those reasons. So I think there is an education process in terms of expectations, uh, and, and I think that's probably the best I can do on that one. Though. There's a whole lot that we didn't have time to cover today, but I'd like to thank uh, Shannon and Eric and uh, join the two of them in thanking you all for coming today. So thank you. Thank you.